is that you have to think about everything you do in your speech. And that's everything from what case you come up with, to what you label your argument, to how you present your argument, to where in your speech you present your arguments. And if you start to think about all of those individual elements of your speech, your speeches will improve a lot. Because very quickly, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you already know a lot of this stuff, you know what makes a good and bad speech. You can probably easily recognise what makes a good and bad argument. And that's why we let everybody in this room adjudicate debates, because we trust your judgement to ascertain what is a good and bad speech. Um, so you know, and you will learn more as you debate, what makes a good and bad speech. The key thing is to incorporate that knowledge into your speeches and into your case preparation. And I think that one of the reasons why you always have to be conscious of what you're doing in your debates is that you're consistent. People can occasionally give a great speech, and people can occasionally speak exactly the time, people can occasionally have the perfectly constructed argument case, but the best debaters in the world are those who do it every single debate. And I don't think there's a, such a thing as a natural world champion. I don't think anybody can come straight out of high school and go and live worlds. And I think the best evidence for that is that in recent years, all of the world champions were in a world's grand final uh, recently before they won. So Victor and Fee this year have been in the world's grand final previously. Will Jones and James Drake in the world's grand final previously. Chris Croke had uh, Joe Nan and Mike Connolly, another group of world champions. They've all done it before. And, and they had that experience. And so it's about practice and it's about uh, applying what you know consistently. So this is really hard, right? This is the hardest thing that you'll have to uh, come across in a debate, and that's in debating, and that's actively thinking throughout your whole case preparation. And the reason why it's difficult is because debating is really chaotic. It's a completely ridiculous proposition, really, to say, here's half an hour or 15 minutes, Come with a solution to climate change, and then you have to persuade an audience of it and do it in three eight minute speeches. It's a bit of a ridiculous proposition, but that's what we're asking you to do. So things get chaotic, you've got to respond to your opposition's arguments. Um, and it is a stressful environment, it's competitive. So you have to be proactive about making sure that you're actively thinking about the past of your speech. And the ways that you can do that are by practicing, by doing lots of debates, but also by using your teammates. Uh, at Austral's last year, when I debated with Phil and Steph, we had lots of checklists that we would quiz each other on before uh, we got up to speak, like, are you rebutting this point? What is your label for this argument? How are you presenting this argument? So that we made sure that we were um, doing the right things. We knew what the right way to debate was, just sometimes you don't implement it when you're under pressure. Um, we wrote checklists, so you can actually, and Duncan and I did this when we debated at Worlds a few years ago, we had checklists that we'd go through after each case break to make sure we hadn't forgotten anything. Um, and also you have to find out what works for you. You have to know what your limitations are. Are you the kind of person that always speaks over time? Well, then you should take proactive measures to prevent that. Do write reminders on your speech, like sit the fuck down uh, when you're halfway through your speech. Just little reminders for yourself so that you don't um, make the same mistakes over and over again. And also, I guess, listen to your adjudicators, listen to your teammates so that you can uh, get better. Okay, so that's... That's just a general approach. I just think you have to be more proactive about thinking about how you're debating. And part of that is even when you're doing very casual debating competitions like three on three here or the open competition or the novice competition, is that you don't waste the opportunity to give a speech. Realistically, you only have the opportunity to give a couple of dozen speeches throughout the entire year. And so you really have to make the most just of all the speeches that you give. Um, and you have to be more proactive about, um, about the speeches that you're making and using this training opportunities. So, case construction. Um, These are some basic thoughts about case construction. I think the first question you have to ask yourself, especially on the affirmative side, is is there a problem under the status quo uh, related to the topic that you've been given? So, if the topic is um, that we should uh, ban the, that we should lift the ban on ivory on, the, on ivory training, you have to ask yourself, is there a problem? Are there two two elephants? Are people really missing their ivory? Like, what's the problem that you're trying to address? that exist under the status quo. Then you have to look at what the causes are of the problem, and then you have to ask how we can go about solving that problem by addressing those causes. And then lastly, is it worth the costs associated with the solution in order to solve that problem? I think a good example of this is in the climate change debate. So in a debate like that, uh, what's the problem under the status quo that we're trying to address there? Pardon? Yep. Yeah, so climate change and the associated environmental consequences. Um, and what are the causes of that problem? What's causing climate change? Yeah, 
carbon emissions than anything else? Like what? Burning more fossil fuels. Yep, that's a good example. So, yep, good. Deforestation. So then we've got increased emissions, not just carbon emissions, but also things like methane. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, increased deforestation, reduced plant life, and all those other things that process carbon dioxide. So they're the causes of the problem. But then breaking that down further, that there are causes of those causes. So carbon emissions, there is the transport sector, the energy generation sector, the agricultural sector. Um, in terms of deforestation, there are all kinds of causes of that, overpopulation, uh, increased urban sprawl, increased human consumption for, for livestock and things like that. So you need to look at the causes of the problem and the real underlying causes um, that are causing the problem. And then you have to ask yourself, are we solving the problem by addressing those causes? And in most debates, you won't be able to address every single cause of a problem. So if it's a debate about uh, uh, having affirmative action for uh, indigenous, the indigenous population for seats in parliament, there are lots of problems associated with the indigenous population in Australia. And by giving them seats in parliament, you're not going to solve all of those problems. Uh, and you're not going to address all of the causes of those problems. So you want to look at what you can solve and articulate that to the audience uh, in your speech. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you have a comparative thing, why are, why it is so important that we solve that problem, and why it is what the cost is actually with doing. Yep. Is that what the idea of trade offs come in? So, like, what trade off you need to sacrifice in order for you to achieve this desired outcome? <laughs> yes. Um, that's exactly right. And, and in almost all debates, you do have to make trade offs. And often they're, they're classic trade offs that have kind of plagued political theorists and philosophers for centuries. So, it's like, how much do we trade off? Privacy versus security. How much do we trade off uh, individual rights versus safety? So, how much do you process to give criminals versus how much do we want to protect society? How much do we pursue equality versus efficiency? We can give welfare to everybody, and that might lead to a more equal society, but it won't lead to a more efficient society. And you need to get to, uh, like you were saying, the trade-offs associated and inherent in your model, in your solution to the problem that you're addressing. And, and once you get to those trade-offs, you'll get to the principled reasons for your debate, uh, for your case. Um, another quick point about case construction is you really need to have a clear idea of what you want the world to look like in the future. And I think this is particularly important in international relations debates. Often people propose a policy without any conception of what they want the world to look like in the future. So they'll say, we think we should invade Syria, or we think we should withdraw our troops from, um, from Afghanistan, or we think we should abolish the Security Council. But they don't have any clear conception of what they want the world to look like in five years or ten years or fifty years. And you really need to have that clear conception of what the future looks like and then talk about how your model moves you there um, in, in international relations debates in particular. I think. So in a debate like Afghanistan, you need to have a clear idea of what you think the country will look like after we withdraw troops or what it would look like if we didn't withdraw troops. Um, and you need to articulate to the audience what that vision is and then how you're going to get there. The last thing about case construction is, and this is really important, is to focus on the points of difference between your solution and the opponent's solution. Because often, uh, not that often, but, but most of the time in debates, um, you have consensus about whether or something's a problem. So everybody will agree that, there are, that there's problems associated with the indigenous population. Everybody will agree that we need to do something about climate change. Everybody will agree that we need to do something about uh, the economy in the United States. But, you really need to focus on the points of difference between your solution and the opposition solution. And a good example of that is talking about a carbon tax versus an emissions trading scheme. Both sides are going to agree that we need to do something. Both sides are going to agree that we need government intervention. And it's just a question about the points of difference between a carbon tax versus an ETS. Another good example of that would be um, whether or not you have budget stimulus versus austerity measures, measures or budget cuts. Um, and so they're both solutions and fairly technical solutions to economic problems, and if you spend all your time talking about how we need to do something about the US economy because it's taking, you're not ever going to win the debate because you need to focus on the points of difference between the two solutions being proposed. And as an affirmative team, you need to think carefully about whether or not you think the negative team is going to agree with the problem that you've isolated and the cause of the problem that you've isolated. Because if you spend all eight minutes in your first affirmative speech talking about things that everybody's going to agree on, then you only have really two speeches to win the debate. Generally, that's not enough. 
So, coming up with arguments. This is really hard, and there's no easy answers for this. So, um, but I think generally, especially people, you know, smart guys like yourself, can easily come up with five arguments, which is all you need uh, in a three-on-three -three debate. And once you have the five arguments, it's more of a question about how you make those arguments as effective as possible. So, but some quick ways to come up with more arguments, and to think about all the stakeholders in a debate. And the stakeholders are basically just any group of people that are affected by, um, by a proposal. So if the debate was about um, that we should allow international adoption, uh, who are some of the stakeholders involved in that? Which children? Sorry? Yeah, so the kids that are getting adopted and taken over, any other kids affected? Yeah, which kids? Yeah, that's good. So kids that need adoption within Australia, any other kids? Yeah, good. So siblings that are currently with family, any other kids? Yeah, so other, other kids that are currently in childhood, something like that. The kids that are left behind that aren't adopted out of the uh, international countries. Any other stakeholders? Parents. Which parents? Both. Like, of the adopted kids and like the biological parents and the parents who are adopted. Yep. Good. Uh, any other stakeholders involved? Pardon? Individuals. Laws of human trafficking. Yeah, great. Uh, human traffickers. Yep. Any others? <laughs> the natives, yeah, nice. <laughs> All these crazy Eastern European kids uh, yelling at um, Also, <laughs> international adoption, that's where they come from. Um, uh, also, governments are another stakeholder. So, the Australian government and the, the government of the country that you're adopting your child from. And so, by looking at the stakeholders and by having a bit more nuance and sophistication about the way that you characterise stakeholders, you can come up with arguments pretty quickly. So we have our government, we have their government, we have the adopted parents here, we have the parents that give up the, the biological parents back home, we have the children that are left behind in the country, we have the children that are leaving the country, we have siblings back here, we have kids that are currently up for adoption here, we have other kids that are part of the, the child welfare system in Australia. We already have about nine or ten stakeholders, all of which could become arguments in and of themselves. And so it's a good way that you can come up with more material in a debate. Uh, and more sophisticated material as well. Another important argument to think about is whatever you think the opposition's flagship argument is going to be, and you want to think about whatever outcome they're out to achieve, and you want to try and make an argument that is also going to achieve that, so long as it's kind of consistent with your overall approach. So, um, in a debate on uh, that we should ban uh, hate speech by Political groups. What do you think the main argument of the affirmative side would be? Good, right. So, so the affirmative might say that hate speech isn't uh, just speech, it's often an incitement to, to violence or an incitement to action. And so that will be a line of the affirmative. And I'll say, well, by the government banning it, we'll reduce that type of speech and we'll get rid of it. And the negative team, in prep, should think that's going to be their main argument. They're going to emphasise that. So, what's a way that we can reduce uh, that to happen under our model, by, and which would presumably be by allowing that speech to occur in an open and transparent way? Well, there's a few ways. And one is that the speech will go underground, as people will call it. So, it will be less criticised, it will happen in a more pernicious way, without anybody to respond to it, without anybody um, criticising that speech. And then these groups themselves will become more hidden and harder to monitor, so they're more likely to be able to get up to um, violent acts or other kinds of illegal acts. And so, from the negative side, you can come up with ways that will achieve the same outcome that the affirmative team wants and really wants, um, but doing it in a way that doesn't have the associated costs. And that's a really effective way of coming up with arguments, and arguments that can be decisive in the back. Because if you can say, yeah, look, our model might not be as effective. Violence that are uh, incited by hate speech, but it's going to get rid of a lot of them, um, and we don't have all the associated costs and harms. Uh, does anybody have any other thoughts about framework arguments? 
Oh, and then the last one, and this is important, is um, just assume that your model works, 